Hello, and welcome back to Star Wars Minute. It's the daily podcast where we analyze, scrutinize, and uh, a ship that Ray seems to recognize. The Star Wars movies, one minute at a time. Uh, I'm Pete the Retailer from PeteTheRetailer.com. I'm Alex Robinson, and my website is AlexRobinson.fun. I'm Tasha Robinson from Polygon.com. Yeah, thanks for thanks for joining us, Tasha. Have you considered? Oh boy, it's been a while. It has. It's Long been time. A, have you considered getting Tasha Robinson dot fun? Because I hear they're, <laughs> it's a trending thing. So all the kids are doing. I it. I had not considered that, but I feel like I've got to lock down Tasha Robinson everywhere. I'm I'm still waiting for an invite to Blue Sky. Oop, we just uh, lost you. Still have not gotten on Mastodon. Still still waiting for that exactly the right opportunity to jump on Peach. There just there's so many Peach. different places that I could be right now. I yeah, I know about Peach. Peach. <laughs> Oh, Pe- Peach is, it, it's a long running in joke. One of my co-podcasters right. at uh, the Next Picture Show podcast, oh, right. where we talk about cinema, is uh, a longtime Peach fan. And I, th- I think Peach okay. peaked, I don't know, five, seven years ago. What even is time anymore, you guys? Yeah, yeah. it's over. It's in the cabinet with Meerkat. And uh, <laughs> there's another one that I keep forgetting quasi or something like that anyway let's just say peach was a long long time ago perhaps in a galaxy far far long away. time long time yeah. well um today we're here to talk about minute 30 three zero, 30 of uh star wars episode 9 the rise of skywalker uh 30 starts with ray saying never underestimate a droid and it ends with ray and the droids and everybody else kind of landing in a uh, gravel pit of some sort <laughs> so um yes they uh they she was ray starts out uh, ray is impressed with bb8's strategy and and uh she had just kind of uh dismissed bb8 suggestion as uh you know as i said i think uh yesterday's episode kind of like the way you would uh you know a child she yes. uh, she underestimated a yeah. She underestimated a droid, but I, I love the sort of the jaunty tone that she says that in feels very much like she's dispensing life advice to Chewbacca. Like, like the tone is basically you shouldn't have you shouldn't underestimate a droid. Other people who are not me when she's yeah. I, presumably talking to herself. I mean, she she should know by now that BB-8 has it on the ball. Pun, yeah. I guess not originally <laughs> intended, but now I'm going to yeah. I'm going to lean into it. I mean, you it. can take credit for it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I don't know. The, the way people t- treat droids in general in Star Wars is just endlessly remarkable, considering that they're, mm. you know, fully sapient beings if you don't wipe their memories every five minutes. And the fact that she goes directly from shut up, you stupid droid. We don't need your help to. Oh, you fixed our problem. Well, world, <laughs> here's some good advice for you. Never under <laughs> un- never underestimate a droid. Thanks, Ray. Yeah. yeah. It's a classic. Well, it is, she is in, I'm getting my timeline confused, is, but this is in the earlier in this movie, right? Is Princess Leia, General Leia, sorry, says that to Rey in, right? I'm not, I'm not. Wow, is that true? I, I wouldn't be surprised because that is absolutely the kind of callback uh, that this kind of movie would love, but I have not revisited this movie I, since it first came out. And I kind of watched now, the framing part for this moment to to figure out where we were, but I did not go back far enough to to get General <laughs> Leia's good advice. Yeah. Did did I she lost track also uh, did did that did General Leia say that like immediately after like I don't know kicking C three PO for saying for <laughs> translating something and then finding out that whatever he just translated was super important. <laughs> it would be consistent at least. I, I lost um, track if that line was one because all of her lines in this movie, all of Leia's lines are, you know, repurposed stuff from the other movie. So I lost track of whether she said it in this movie or whether this was something that there it was. I lost track of where it was actually said. So, yeah, that's why that's why I'm trying to look it up. I'm like, wait a minute. Was that was it something that she said earlier that they then replayed? Uh, um, and everybody's yelling at us because it was just, you know, it's like, oh, dude, that was like, you know. Four minutes of the movie ago, but that was like a full week or plus, a week plus ago. Yeah, it all, it's all for us together. Um, I guess it would be nice if this is, if it's a callback, at least it has much less of a, an air of, I don't know, just refusing to admit when you're wrong. The, the idea of not saying, 
oh, right, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I was a jerk to you one second ago, but instead kind of phrasing it. Like, I like to do that in my own life. If I if I yell at somebody for trying to help me and then I realize they were trying to help me, I like to turn yeah. to somebody else and say, I, I don't know, just sort of dispense a, a fortune cookie version of the lesson one could learn from this experience as opposed to personalizing it by, like, apologizing. <laughs> Right. I do like that it calls back uh, 3PO in Empire Strikes Back uh, is yelling at R2 when they're trying to escape from Cloud City and 3PO is yelling at R2, you know, saying, oh, what are you, an idiot? And then once he fixes it, 3PO is like, I never doubted you for a second. And so <laughs> right. it's kind of like a similar uh, thing, except although I guess when 3PO says it, we're all supposed to be laughing at 3PO that he's, you know, a, a, a hypocrite. But I guess when Ray says it, it's, we're supposed to be like, yeah, she gets it. Well, I mean, that also just uh, it goes back to A New Hope and getting everybody out of the trash bin where 3PO is screaming his head off about how clearly yeah. everybody is dead and it's his fault. And in the meantime, R2 has rescued everyone. Leia certainly has been rescued by R2 enough that she should know not to ever underestimate a droid and, and to be able to dispense that advice to people. Yeah, this is true. Yeah, I've been frantically looking in the background and I... I'm trying to, it's, I think it's after they land, they get together. Um, when, the, when they have the little meeting right around the same time as, as, uh, um, you know, somehow Palpatine has returned. And then uh, I think somewhere in here, they come up with something. Anyone who cares is already yelling at us. And anyone who doesn't I know, know doesn't I know. care <laughs> at this point. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I thought I'm I had it here, the, and then I can't. Yeah. Well, so I'm this is uh, at the point of if it didn't happen, it should have happened. Right. Yeah. It's all subjective. Yeah. Subjective experience. So yeah, we get a canyon chase in this minute. This minute is mostly the uh, canyon chase. Very, very mm -hmm. uh, pod racy to me. Very uh, prequel kind of energy to it. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, uh, bite your tongue! I think this is so much better than the pod race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it's a little bit. Prequely, it does recall the uh, um, the pod race a little bit, but it's all you know. It's a slightly different, uh, it's much shorter, know, it's shorter. <laughs> so it's not a whole week or two two weeks. I think we spent on the pod race, but it's also um, you know the stakes are more immediate in in a sense that they're like, oh, they're being chased by stormtroopers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, to me, it recalls maybe more than that. I, the in the in the way each of these movies to some degree is reaching back to the equivalent movie in the original trilogy this movie is is heavily patterned after return of the jedi and it reminds me a lot of the forest race on the uh, the hover speeders so mm -hmm. they, you know there's there's even in this minute itself you have somebody uh fastening a a rope onto like a pursuing speeder and, and spinning around to slam it into a like a local piece of terrain so it it reminds me of that a lot more than it reminded me of the pod race which felt very weightless at the time just like hmm. a lot more cg uh i was going to ask you if you have any idea what these vehicles with the the treads are called because normally in uh star wars like every personal conveyance like this is a uh, some form of a hover bike but this thing is a, a physical, visceral thing that rolls along the ground, or at least it's a CG mm. thing that appears to. And mm. it just feels, I don't know, jankier and, and weighter and jankier and weightier and more real than and like any of the pod racing stuff did to me. Yeah, I was going to say, I wonder if that's because of, because of the terrain, but the pod race that we saw was on yeah. incredibly similar terrain, so it's probably not it. Alex, what, what do you got? Well, uh, the the vehicle in question is right on the back of the visual dictionary. It's the First hmm. Order Tread Speeder. Get a little shot tread of it speeder. there. <laughs> and uh, it does move very fast for a tread. You don't think of things with treads as moving. Usually you think of treads, you're sacrificing speed for stability. So it's mm. it's it's weird seeing something with treads move that quickly. You know what I mean? But uh, you know, yeah, I, physics I think of Star of, Wars, right? Tread vehicles. Yeah, I think of tread vehicles in Star Wars as you know more like the the Jawas giant uh, yeah. house house on treads yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, something uh, 
kind of like ponderous and meant meant to be a, a city on treads as much as anything else. And this thing feels more like a chainsaw, like at the the speed that it runs. Mm. It that's what yeah. it reminded me. Especially the the image that Alex just held up. You can see that the back end where the uh, operator is sitting is elevated above everything. Like they they're kind of like up on a, a teeter-totter end, more or less, with their feet just kind of dangling in the air like a little kid, which, again, does not seem very stable, even for a, uh, a tread device. Yeah. Well, now you got me thinking about uh, what if it was a speeder bike with a chainsaw at the end? That would be kind of cool. <laughs> I'd buy, I'd like to see that kind of vehicle. Hmm. That would... It's tough to kind of bump into each other. They'd have to avoid I mean, this... each other. They'd only be like one on each planet, so they don't run into the themselves this whole sequence does have also i guess a little bit of mad max fury road to it just you know racing through the desert yeah. slamming people and uh, and taking people down and just strapping chainsaws all over your uh whatever vehicle you're <laughs> operating that, that, that would be a good idea in a mad max situation yeah it is it is funny that we've so, never seen you know like a grease thing where like a in grease the movie the the movie sure. musical that where they're remember the guy right. has the evil car and he has those little spiky things that stick out and he's mm-hmm. trying to uh to wreck Danny the the grease lightning um right yeah so it seems like that would be a good thing to have on like a speeder bike type scenario right yeah. Star Wars seems like really Ben-Hur. big into its uh explosively uh into its explosively charged like rope devices. There's a lot of that kind of like grappling hook uh, sort of thing, or, you know, in this case, just letting out a line with a hook on it. So there's, mm-hmm. there's yeah. something about using a, a rope to take something down that feels very Star Wars in a way that maybe chainsaws sure. and or uh, greased lightning <laughs> killers wouldn't work. <laughs> it does. Uh, it, it did give me pause that it's like, ah, this, this you know, crazy looking new uh, Imperial vehicle is taken down as easily as my Roomba. do you do you have cats possibly that sit on your roombas because now i want to see a cat on one of these treadmobiles (laughs) oh yeah there you go uh so yeah this 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 death here is very uh very visceral where you where the Hmm. he goes slamming into the uh into the cliffside and there's big explosion and then you see the guy kind of like is this the bit where you see him flying landing on the ground and it kind of like lingers on him there or is this is that one of the other ones that's coming up no, um that, that i think that's here okay yeah yeah the prequels generally- uh, that, that actually that actually doesn't feel like a death to me that that feels like a, a gi joe yes we blew up your plane but of course somebody's parachuting out of it moment like uh-huh. yeah he didn't explode he just landed on the sand and as we see by the end of this moment like being flung through the air and landing on sand is no big deal. And certainly it would take no, no harm from such a thing. Well, I assume you're referring to the end. I'm go. I have to assume that everyone, at least some of them die and have multiple injuries and stuff like that. So <laughs> yeah. that should have ended with that. And then directed by JJ Abrams at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just uh, yes, the over tragic a, a, ending just, of the series. Yeah. The fire that is the wreck of their speeder or their stolen car rather. <laughs> um, yeah, it did strike me as very yeah, GI Joe or the A Team, where it's just like, oh no, big explosion, but uh, don't worry, everybody's okay. Like, yeah, because we, we have to legally show you that. Well, we do. We do have people exploding in this scene. I don't know why this one guy yeah. is is special. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. Maybe he's like the <laughs> nephew of uh, somebody, somebody behind the mm. scenes. That's James Bond, isn't it? Daniel, isn't that Daniel Craig playing <laughs> the, uh, playing that particular Star Trooper? <laughs> I'm running back and just sort of checking to see what the what the body count here might be in terms mm-hmm. of people we definitely see explode versus uh, <laughs> people who are very obviously flung to safety. Hmm. One thing I kind of miss with the First Order is that level of, um, if you recall in The Force Awakens, they, they seem to take it very personally that Finn had defected. Remember the guy, traitor, and they all like yeah. know him. Um, I kind of miss that aspect of it. Like it would have been... I, I don't know, Maybe now it's, you know, a year and a half later. So all this, all the troopers who knew him have all been like recycled through and died off. So now these are all people who never heard of Finn or anything like that. But uh, I kind of miss that personal angle of it. Hmm. You think that guy should have come back? Traitor guy? Yeah. 
Joe. Hmm. Trader Joe. Oh, God. Oh, boo. Yeah, it's possible <laughs> that nobody actually dies in this minute. The guy whose uh, speeder is the tread thing the guy whose tread thing is slammed into a rock you can you can visibly see him go flying off to one side and the flying stormtrooper who's taken down is the one that lands in the sand so Mm -hmm. you know there's there's nobody actually caught inside an explosion in a seemingly unsurvivable Mm way what all of which means to me i mean having just gotten out of fast x the movie series where nobody ever dies permanently and and they all come back Mm -hmm. sooner or later my assumption is that all of the stormtroopers that knew Fen and resented his switching sides got caught up in you know various shootouts, but they're fine and they survived and they will be back somewhere along the line. They will return. Also, yeah. return of the return of the stormtroopers. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I have learned about uh, the Star Wars media as a whole is that no character of any interest or value is ever really wasted they find ways to bring them back. think about how many times they brought back darth maul and yeah. you know just who survived being cut in half but you know even the smallest characters the uh the guy who gets his arm cut off in the cantina in a new hope has a complicated and lengthy backstory the the guy who says uh, i'm wanted on nine systems has a lengthy mm-hmm. complicated backstory and and four story so there's there's no reason Trader Guy can't have his own arc, maybe his own series down the line. Yeah, Disney <laughs> Plus. Yeah, well, I'm pretty sure somebody's probably given him a a story. I don't know if it's you know like how how deep does he go? It might just be a comic story about one thing that happened to him one day, or it might be a whole yeah. you know elongated deep dive into his psyche. Well, well the world may never know. It's out there, but we're not going to read it. Finn's whole relationship with other stormtroopers, I feel like, is is just one of the great untold stories of the sequel series. Just in terms of how he felt about uh, going on to kill tons of them, how the rest of them survived being going through the same process that he did. Like, how many more of them are? How many more of them are out there who are like Finn and who who just won out? Like, the sequel series just kind of suggested that and then completely uninterested in it. Hmm. Would, would I want to see a prequel of like Finn just before force awakens, basically Finn and his, and his stormtrooper buddies. I don't think I would. Maybe I would. A one off one shot, not a whole thing. Just like a, like a, like a TV, like a one hour special where they sing. (laughs) Maybe they, maybe, you know, somebody comes along and does some comedy sketches. Like a holiday special of some sort? Yeah, yeah, that kind of a thing. How could that possibly go wrong? <laughs> it is it is weird to me that they basically, there's, that we've had two characters who were essentially slaves, Anakin Skywalker and now Finn. And they in neither case did they do the storyline of a, for, a freed slave coming back to free the other slaves. Like to me, that seems like such a natural, like uh, even if even if Anakin didn't do it, it seems like that would have been something he would have wanted to do, you know, as a mm. as a as a Jedi. But uh, the the movies in general take a very uh, hands off attitude towards slavery, uh, uh, peculiarly for the heroes to do. So it's yeah, weird. or even bringing that concept up, which just seems like a very natural thing that you would talk about in such a a black and white good and evil universe the idea of feeling some sort of responsibility for other people who suffered the way you suffer just seems like a natural topic i guess yeah i guess we get a taste of it at the end when not at the end or when when finn meets the the i guess group of other people who have defected but they also don't seem to have any hesitation about killing other stormtroopers too so right yeah. As far as Anakin goes, I, they explained it off, I think, with a kind of a hand wave of Jedi aren't supposed to have attachments, which is why he never went back for his mother. But the fact that it just it didn't come up is bothersome. The fact that it didn't come up for Finn either is bothersome. Like I I am okay with 
any kind of narrative sort of deciding this is what the story is we're going to focus here but when nobody seems to think of sort of what the emotional impact would be of being a freed slave among slaves and then just never thinking about those slaves again it just it it makes the characters come across as very selfish very i got mine i climbed the ladder and i pulled it up after me in a way that i just don't think is intended yeah yeah plus like you have slaves and droids which we treat more or less like slaves <laughs> and yet we're not going to talk about any any of that you know and guess what this slave built a droid but the old guy who owns the slave doesn't own that droid <laughs> i think i don't know it's a, what an odd thing um i mean we could but we're not, yeah, ugly, they don't go into it cans so. of worms there yeah exactly <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, hey, speaking of that droid that was built by a slave, though. Oh, what were you going to say, Tasha? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, he I heard you on other on earlier episodes from this season talking about uh, apparently Alex is a, a fan of C-3PO's which, and, and C-3PO's arc in this uh, movie in particular. And that uh -huh. really surprised me because the, hmm. the whole business with we're going to erase your memory uh, for for reasons and him like deciding to make this noble sacrifice for his friends who are awful people who treat him like crap. And the, the way they kind of respond to that, like, well, of course you are. You're an object. That's our property. Like, get on with mm -hmm. the erasing of him so we can have our thing. Like, it's just it's so casual. And then, of course, it's also immediately taken back. I would love to hear more about what you love so much about that plot line or how it's executed. Or just what he does in this movie. Well, that particular aspect of the plot line, I agree. I think it, I didn't like that part of it. I think it was kind of like um, I'm thinking more, I guess, but the the humor because C3PO didn't really get to do anything in the previous two movies. This is the this is the first time he gets to like accompany the gang on an adventure, and he gets good he gets good comedy bits. Uh, yeah, and um, and in a way where you're kind of almost. He, laughing more with him than at him which traditionally c 3 is the butt of the joke and in this one he seems a little bit sassier i don't like the whole uh like um the same thing with the chewbacca thing i feel like throwing out like a death and then immediately taking it back seems mm. I, I don't know yeah i'm not crazy about it and um especially with a droid like he would be backed up there's no yeah you know well i think the the only we hear, we don't hear everybody else saying like, oh, it's too bad. We got to do, you know, yeah. they're just like, yeah, we're, we're going to do that. C-3PO is the one saying, oh, no, it'd be terrible if you had to do this because yeah. he reacts like that to everything. So, yeah, you know. Which once again He's kind of puts his, his his supposed death in the place of like, it, it's another it's another iteration of this comedy bit that he's been doing for, you know, nine movies is like, oh no, he's afraid of things that you don't need to be afraid of. That's, that's our 3PO. He's hilariously scared of stuff. Well, in this case, what he's scared of is his own incipient death, which he decides to face <laughs> for these people. And it, it just kind of plays as the same sort of beat, except it, it's like the sad core beat. It's like a, a trailer song that's been slowed down uh, so that it'll it'll hit with more impact. So, you know, instead of, oh, no, we're going to die. It's, oh, oh, no, I'm going to die. But it's it's still kind of the same beat, especially since it has like no weight going forward. I don't yeah. know. It kind of drives me nuts. <laughs> He has, 3PO has a, just a, a fun little moment here. He's, yeah. I think, maybe the only one of our characters in this minute that doesn't take some kind of, like, interesting action. But he he throws in a little, like, huzzah kind of reaction. Yeah. This is right uh, ho. That, right ho. Which, <laughs> right ho. You know, that's very <laughs> Anthony Daniels. It's just very cute and very British as a response yeah. to, you just did some crazy action. <laughs> Just to remind everybody that he's still there. <laughs> I want to. I want to see the uh, the sessions with him in the studio, improvising different enthusiastic, <laughs> you know, hip hip hooray and. <laughs> I love and the hopefully he got a little, just... mixed it up a little bit, you know. <laughs> like, you go, girl. I love the idea of... You know, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I love the idea of Abrams just standing in a room like, now your friends have just killed a stormtrooper. What do you say? 
<laughs> okay, now now a, a vehicle has exploded. What do you say? And he's just in there like pip pip. Oh, absolutely topping. <laughs> Uh, I, I think oh, bringing up 3PO's, you know, him being afraid, it's, it's kind of funny because he is the character who, who suffers the most. I mean, he gets blown into pieces, he gets dismembered and attached to different droids, he has his memory erased at least one time, we have to assume multiple times over the, over the years. He gets to walk around naked in front of everyone. It's, it's, <laughs> it's almost like kind of, um, you know, like... It's almost kind of funny in like a Trials of Job kind of way. Like, oh, of course, mm. everything bad has to happen to three feel. So I don't know. Uh, Whatever. I'm I'm and fine now now with something actually as, finally does, and then it comes back. Yeah, I, I'm fine with it as kind of an overall uh, comedy beat, and I'm fine with him walking around naked all the time because he has a really nice ass for a <laughs> droid in this uh, series. Mm. You know, it's, shiny it's a metal of, ass. A lot of like <laughs> round. <laughs> You can bite his shiny metal ass. There's a lot of round, uh, you know, droid droid bits in this movie and many others. You know, BB-8 is basically just one giant buttock, if you look at it that way. But, uh, you know, he's he's wow. molded. C-3PO is molded to have a, a pretty nice ass. Maybe you would <laughs> maybe you'd run around naked all the time, too, if you spent all your time traveling in, like, horrible desert, desert climates. And you just had, like, yeah. a, an ass that you could bounce a diode off of. <laughs> it'd be uh oh go ahead Pete. no i i was gonna say i think c-3po thinks that he's not naked Remember, he thought he was naked when he had no covering on yeah he was like oh naked and he gets all upset but then once there's just this what we think of as his skin it might actually be more like clothes to him <laughs> he's like in a, a metal get... gimp suit right oh no <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're going uh, to bad the, places. I'm I'm the one talking about his his sweet sweet chromium ass, and you're right. you're just you're taking it to bad places. It'll be interesting to see if uh, you know because C3PO is kind of like an Art Deco kind of thing going on, and like as we said, the the modern stormtroopers seem like they're kind of like designed by like Apple. Uh, it'll be yeah. interesting to see what the next iteration of like what what kind of. Uh, theme than the next round of droids and technology will have will it be like steampunky or will it be uh you know kind of a, a 50s you know i am a robot you know square and blocky <laughs> and and all that stuff hmm. kind of a i mean it, it kind of seems like a direction that they've been moving in is just more humanoid in in terms of like movement and um an attitude. The the robot in Rogue One, which I'm so sure one of you can pull the serial number off, like off the top of your head, but it's uh th that's Lena Waithe, isn't it? Uh Phoebe Phoebe Bridgers. Phoebe No wait. Phoebe Bridgers, I'm sorry. Phoebe um, Waller Bridges. And yeah. that's solo. So, so Oh, oh you're talking about Rogue one, one. one. Sorry. Rogue One is K two SO, which is um Alan, Alan, Tudyk. Alan Tudyk. Okay. No, yeah. I am I am thinking of Solo. Uh, I am clearly mixing everything into a, a giant Star Wars salad, which is why you're the experts and I'm not. <laughs> I could go for but, a Star Wars uh, salad. Phoebe Waller Bridge's robot like walks with that sort of like like hip shot gimbaled way that just feels much more humanoid than a lot of the ways that a lot of these uh, these droids move. And I guess you you walk that back somewhat with the Mandalorian and uh, Taika Waititi's robot, who is a a robot, listen to me. Uh, Tango Tini's droid, who is a, a very droidly droid, who moves yeah. in ways that humans couldn't. So I guess, you know, you, they move back and forth along that divide. Like, what can we do with droid bodies that a humanoid couldn't do? And then you get something like BB-8 that's just completely unique movement and very, very non-human. And then you kind of walk that back in a direction of, okay, how can we make a droid seem more human and in like in attitude and in voice and in design and physical movement as well. So I, I think they're just kind of veering back and forth along the line, maybe according to individual directors or maybe just according to what can we, what can we do that's different from the last project? Right. We want our droid to stand out. <laughs> I guess important in a, a series with so many of them. Yeah. Uh, Tasha, I can't quite tell uh, your, your um, 
you know, this movie was, we'll say polarizing or some people have divisive <laughs> opinions. And you seem like you parts of it you didn't like, but you don't seem like you're totally like, oh, this was a terrible movie. Am I wrong about that? Or are you kind of in the middle there? Alex, oh, this was a terrible movie. <laughs> oh. All right. It, it made me so angry in the moment because I, I, think Last Jedi has its flaws, but the whole, like, let's kill the past, let's move on theme to it, I thought was was daring. I, I thought it was something that the Star Wars movies and the Star Wars franchise as a whole has needed for a long time. And I, I feel like whenever Star Wars, to some degree, like walks away from the Skywalker saga, or even just walks away from the the central idea of Sith and Jedi, dark side and light side, even force users with um, even force users with lightsabers. I like it more. I like I loved Andor. I really enjoyed the first season of Mandalorian. I've been enjoying a lot of what's going on with uh, with Star Wars visions, particularly when it steps away from Jedi and Sith, which it doesn't do often enough. Mm -hmm. But we're we're moving in that direction. So I feel like there's a ton of Star Wars that that is working its way away from the the Skywalker saga. And Ryan Johnson with Last Jedi tried to do that. And and to me, at least, Return of Skywalker was just J.J. Abrams saying, oh, God, oh, oh, God, the some of the loudest fans didn't like that. We we take it all back. Never mind. Everything that movie said, not true. Retcon, retcon. Just like. You know, he's just like like yelling into the phone, like uh, in uh, Pulp Fiction, just prank call, prank call. And it just it seemed so disrespectful to me of somebody who tried to do something interesting and different. But also it was just so indicative of there not being a plan. You know, I you look at, at Marvel's movies, which I don't love all of them. They're they're not, you know, my my core idea of cinema or anything. But you can really tell that there's a 10 year plan. You can tell that they're they're building each piece and planning each piece and looking ahead. You're seeing that now with James Gunn's DC slate. Uh, a good franchise building, to my mind, means at least having a plan for the next movie when you're writing writing a movie. And in this case, it's just it was just so clear with Return of Skywalker that they didn't have a plan, that they they didn't have a continuity. And that they felt perfectly free to just say everything we said in the last movie was a lie. So the whole business with Palpatine showing back up and, and Ray's familial uh, connections and the dyad nonsense and, and leaning hard into Raylo and then walking it back. The, the have your cake and eat it too of this movie. I just, uh, I loathed it. That said, <laughs> I haven't Pete, revisited I really it since did it came not out in know. theaters. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, I did not know her feelings on the matter because oh, yeah. Pete liked the movie. I did not like the movie. And so I didn't want Pete to think mm -hmm. I ambushed him by pulling that out of you. But Let uh, me just remind everybody of another Star Wars movie that they made without a plan that kind of undid a lot of what they set up in the last movie. That one's called Empire Strikes Back. So mm. uh, the, the only yeah. sequel trilogy, the only trilogy to be fully, f you know, have a, have a, fully formed uh, plan it was the prequel trilogy and you know that's that's yeah, where we went there point. So. but i don't but know i mean i'm I, not going to tell I, anybody they should enjoy this movie i'm just saying i do yeah. Yeah. i i just feel like andor is maybe the example of what you get when you have somebody with a a strong specific vision managing an entire story and i haven't i haven't loved everything that's happened in mandalorian but it does feel like there's a, a through line to it, a, a backbone to it that matters. And that's one of the things I look for in storytelling. Mm -hmm. All that aside, I really enjoyed this minute. And I it made me kind of want to go back and revisit. I, I, I rewatched a chunk of the middle of this movie to put the minute into context. I, I, I really like how everybody's working together here. One of the things I, mm. I really enjoy in genre fiction, uh, I was just talking to my, my co-podcasters about this last night, I really enjoyed the finale of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 because you get to see all of these people with powers working in unison and, you know, e engaging with each other in combat, 
like using their specific skills uh, together. I really like that when it comes up in like the beginning of X-Men Days of Future Past or Avatar The Last Airbender when everybody's using their special powers in coordination. And here you have a one minute sequence where almost everybody does something, whether it's, you know, Chewbacca using his bowcaster to take somebody down or we've we've just finished with BB-8 doing something. We get a little, you know, Poe spin uh, on a, a little flashy piloting that helps Finn do his like clever taking a, a enemy ship down with a rope kind of maneuver. Just like everybody's engaged and, and on point and everybody contributes in this minute. And I, I really like that. I, I really like a story, especially in Star Wars, that isn't just about one special magical person doing special magical person things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's true. It's something that we um, kind of we've talked about the difference between the kind of you know in the in the for the most part in the original trilogy it it's kind of uh all split up it's all parallel action and and in the, and we don't get the kind of resolution that we don't get everybody back together and here is the really the only time where you get everybody together in this you know out of this crew everybody working on the same literally in the same boat <laughs> <laughs> Desert well, until boat. the very end of this minute, when they're all suddenly out of the boats. Uh, what do you? Yes. I I have to know before Never I get say out of the anything. Boat. What what are the what are the two think? What are the two you think about the end of this moment where everybody goes flying through the air and lands in the sand? Uh, I think it's you know a fun visual spectacle. I think it kind of um, it it has that kind of um. Peter Jackson Hobbit quality to me where things don't really have a physicality. They're just kind of like a video game characters where they can be thrown a hundred feet in the air and then land and then just get up mm. and just start running like, or like a Muppet, a Muppet when a Muppet to uh, goes flying through <laughs> the air, threw them all up in the air. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, it's like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that as the, um, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's how I feel about it. It's not that, uh, I don't, you know, Love it or hate it, it's just kind of, yeah, it's a thing that, like, and anything that, uh, part, I think part of it, anything in this movie that I don't like just kind of goes away so quickly that, it's like, oh, yeah. Okay. I just think it's hilarious that both of these vehicles, which seem to be very different vehicles, blow up in exactly the same way with exactly the same effect, which is to hmm. flip people safely through the air. It's like, is is this a, a safety feature of vehicles on this planet is if they explode, they just violently obje- object. Yeah, it's like they a, just violently eject people. It's like a really bad airbag. <laughs> just right. Throwing the airbag is under you. <laughs> 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 eject, eject. <laughs> well, it's particularly funny to me because as, as we see earlier in the same combat sequence, the treadmobiles also have a pop-up function in order to eject the flying stormtroopers. Like that's mm-hmm. that's how mm-hmm. you launch a flying stormtrooper is by having your ship pop up and send somebody shooting through the air. So maybe it is just like a, a specific thing to this planet that all vehicles have to have a pop up function. <laughs> it's all, the law says they have to have in the event of a crash, <laughs> they have to eject the people. Right. I've heard worse. Whether or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or I don't know. Maybe um, it's something that uh, those those little like piggy people find fun. It's just let's let's go out into the sand and pop ourselves up off our uh, vehicles into the air. Like that's <laughs> that's a picnic on this planet. It's yeah. uh, pop up vehicle day. <laughs> hey everybody! It's pop up vehicle day. <laughs> pop up vehicle. And there's a merch for you. <laughs> it's just a bunch of little toys that shoot your uh, action figures through the air. Mm, like one of those things with a suction cup on a spring on it and you push Mm -hmm. it down and then eventually the spring uh, makes it fly from the air i like it let's get on that and you play with them in your sandbox for Mm verisimilitude there you go suction cups in sandboxes that i don't like sand but (laughs) no really really Um, what 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 don't you like about it it's so comfortable and uh (laughs) it stays exactly where it's put yeah (laughs) soothing it's fine and uh yeah the end of this minute looks very painful in terms of everybody. Everybody here has mm. got sand up their shorts, right? Am I am I wrong about this? Oh, right and now? And in their teeth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean well, on this podcast. Yeah. 
That's the I least mean, of their worries. Is say, I mean, like, you know, I'm getting to the age where if I'm like trip on a, something on the street and don't land on the ground, but just trip, I'm like, oh, I got to go over to physical therapy now. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> you know, it's luckily they're all young except for Chewie. He's pretty old. So, uh, yeah, I think Chewie is just like, oh, hang on. <laughs> luckily, they have a good health care on uh, Kashyyyk. Hmm. So, Although he does have that extra padding there of the fur. Yeah, mm. plenty of furry padding. Although, yeah. on the other hand, you know how your hair gets after a day at the beach? Like, yeah. mm. I, you guys both have very short hair. I, I yeah. am a long-haired woman, and just between the the air and the wind usually at the beach and the sand, you, you come out with, like, every strand of hair just feeling like it's coated in thick, dry grime. I, I feel like <laughs> Chewie's just going to need, like, blowouts for days. Well, instead, he sort of gets a blow-up <laughs> for days. Oh, there you go. <laughs> blow up, blow out. Two very good uh, films with very different aims. <laughs> yes, I hope they and can... not the other. Uh, wasn't it? Wasn't blow up also? A, there's a Corey and Corey movie, I think called Blow Blow Up or blow, No Blown Away. Sorry, Blown Never Away. Mind. Not a good movie. I would. It didn't really complete the trilogy very well. No, <laughs> so we have blown up, blown out, blown away, and then it's like what. This one, they really kind of didn't, uh, they didn't stick the landing here. <laughs> those two previous movies needed Corey's just to kind of tie yeah, the whole series together. So. It was it was very clear with Blown Up, Blow Up, Blow Out, and Blown Away that there was no plan. And if yeah. there had been a plan, if there'd been a They needed line, someone to be there and say, you know. Would have been Corey's all the way through. Mm. Corey's all the way down. Yeah. We could do some, we could do some editing, maybe. Yeah. Uh, throw in some, some AI, core AI. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not happy with that either. Um, that on that note, those are all my notes for this. Uh, Tasha, did you have anything else for this, or is there anything you want us to look out for in the the future? Uh, you know, two hours of this movie that we have. Oh gosh, uh, I I think I've referenced uh, my my least favorite things of this movie coming, and I I think maybe my most favorite thing you you just finished up with, like. I kind of oh. loved the visual of the the party out in the desert, you know, with the the five thousand yeah. extras kind of mm-hmm. brought in from from all over the place, and especially locally. Like, I interviewed uh, one of the the designers for this movie and just talked a bunch about those costumes and the uh, like the the physical practical uh, aspects of the face tentacles and. Like as you as you get further and further from the camera, you go from much more elaborate costuming to much less elaborate costuming. But in the moment when you're there and they're all doing their like their little desert party burning man dance, uh, I just I really dug all of that. And I wanted to spend more time in it. I understand given the pacing of you know this movie and, and all of these movies that there's not a whole lot of of breather space for that kind of thing and and it makes sense but i wanted to hang out in this sort of local scene which we we just don't get all that much of in star wars it's it's far too often like oh here we are on the all ocean planet the ocean is a, a dramatic backdrop to a big fight or a meeting you know, here we are on the all jungle planet. We'll be attacked by something. Here we are underwater uh, in the, the coral planet. We'll be attacked by something. But actually seeing how people live in the Star Wars universe is something I'm often fascinated with. Do, does anything really stand out to you just like over the course of all these movies that you've seen about the way people live in Star Wars that, that you really like? Hmm. I mean, not... As much in the movies, but as soon as you said that, I thought of Andor and, you know, just eating cereal uh, in Andor. And it's just like, oh, yeah, these are just people who, like, live their lives. Yeah. Um, Or or in Obi-Wan when he's just, like, going to work, like, carving up that whale or whatever he was doing. You know, that uh, – I feel like in the TV show maybe – but TV shows because there's more room to breathe, they do that. And yeah. we don't get as much of it here. Dexter's Diner, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess we mm. don't see very much other than just backdrop for, you know, like Cloud City. And I guess Moss Eisley, we saw a little bit, you know, yeah, the tattoo. Considering how long we've been on Tatooine, you think we would have know more about the uh, what's going on there. But mm. not that and I'm saying I'm, you should do that, Disney. Let's 
the title moratorium for the next 10 years on Tatooine. <laughs> That well, speaking of Tatooine, going back to the you know the very first things that we would have seen, you know that that were cut in the movie was rearranged was you know Luke's kind of American graffiti on Tatooine scenes, which would have been just people kind of going about their business and being like, oh hey, yeah. like well, there's a weird war going on in the sky in the stars, in the stars. But um, yeah, I don't know. We need more good examples of that because it's good. Yeah, especially here where there's just any any time that you have a, a sci-fi world or fantasy world where it's clear that there are ordinary people living their lives and, and they have like local traditions and languages and it's not just, you know, one little blue flying jerk. Uh, and then like later <laughs> the ancillary material has to say, oh, he comes from a race of little blue flying jerks. They're all jerks. They all run junk shops. Uh, they they all have kind of hinky racial characteristics that might be, uh, you know, offensive and very, very questionable. But they're all exactly like that. And here you've got just a much more expansive uh, situation. I guess there's also, a, you know, in Andor, you get that whole kind of subplot about the festival where all the people of the planet come up to the mountain for the, right. the great sky show. Like, I, I liked yeah. that a lot, too. Yeah, I guess Star Trek is more of a let's investigate alien cultures kind of thing, mm. or at least used to be. I don't know what it's like now. Now it's it's really uh, good right now. Is it? Mm. <laughs> I'll have to check it out. I hear it's great, but I can't keep up. I, I do admit I keep up with Star Wars much better than Star Trek. Mm. I, I let a lot of Star Trek go by, but uh, I've just been watching Strange New Worlds. It's really good. Didn't... Uh, Left all the other stuff. I hear it's good. I'll get back to it eventually. But Strange New Worlds, thumbs up. Now that we're talking about Star Trek, I think that means it's time to time to uh, <laughs> cut it. Tasha, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and uh, remind everybody again uh, how they can uh, how they can hear you on a regular. Well, thank you so much for having me on Star Trek Minute. Uh, I always do appreciate the chance to talk about Star <laughs> Trek and the the worlds of Star Trek. Sure. Uh, I am the <laughs> film and streaming editor at Polygon.com. Um, I write about movies and TV and, and books and comics and, and various other things over there. And I am the co-host of the Next Picture Show podcast, where we look at a current movie and compare it with a past movie that inspired it or informed it or in some way is in conversation with it. It's a weekly podcast. You can find us on nextpictureshow.net and on pretty much everywhere where uh, podcasts are produced. Yeah. So check that out and uh, be sure to listen. Be sure to listen to that. Hey, we have other podcasts too. We don't just do this. We've just introduced our latest one, which is called Who Died with Pete and Alex. And uh, every week we are going to take a look at a couple of notable podcasts uh, figures who have uh, passed on in the re most recent seven days or so so uh it's also available should be available now wherever you can get podcasts also on youtube go to who died.xyz to find that and uh then we'll be back on monday with another brand new episode of star wars star minute. wars minute star trek minute oh now <laughs> we gotta start over sorry period of civil war <laughs>